Ready, Bob. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting disorganized. You're getting here. acclimated. <clears throat> okay, the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee of September 17th, 2019 is now called to order. Kim, would you? Yep, Mr. Roll, yep, Mr. Anderson. Here. Mr. Atkinson. Here. Mr. Jessick is not here yet. Mr. Lyman. Here. Mr. Simmons. Here. And absent is Mr. McEnroth, uh, Mr. Tong, and Mr. West. And Mr. LaSalle. Yeah. Well, Mr. LaSalle, yes, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, first item is the minutes of June 18th, 2019. Does anybody have any changes they want to make to those minutes? I do. I've got one. Yes. I just see one that says Mr. Lewis said Malala Avenue will be completely rebuilt in its entirety with the project. And while I'm sure I said that, I wanted to add the um, between Beaver Creek Road and Highway 213 because there's lots more Malala that we're not going to rebuild. So, okay. That's my only thing that I noticed that needed to be changed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All in favor with the revised minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Agenda analysis, does anybody have any changes they want to make or additions to the agenda for this evening? Okay, citizen comments. Um, I'm going to start that with a presentation I wish to make. And I'm going to come down there to make it. You're the, you're the guy, so you can go wherever you want, and wherever you want to go, you're okay. I'll do it from here. You can all do it from here. Uh, but I am representing the Park Place Neighborhood Association in this following information. We, representing the Park Place Neighborhood Association, are asking that the transportation system plan crosswalks on Holcomb Boulevard be raised in their priority. Park Place is experiencing the largest development of any neighborhood in the city, and Holcomb Boulevard is becoming a more dangerous street as we speak. I'm going to give you some figures to think about. The 2017 volume traffic survey by Quality Counts LLC shows that Holcomb Boulevard and Redmond Road a daily count of 9,370 trips. A 2018 transportation impact study by Lancaster Engineering stated, quote, a daily increase of 7,401 daily trips will be generated by the development of the recently annexed portion of the Park Place concept plan, unquote. Now that doesn't include the daily trips generated by the currently developing old airfield property, 98 new dwellings, or the recently annexed Sears property on Holcomb Boulevard, 124 new dwellings. Those could be an additional 2,220 daily trips going up and down Holcomb Boulevard. That comes to a grand total of 9,000 620 additional trips, more than doubling today's trips and challenging even the most nimble pedestrian. Compared to other areas of Oregon City, Park Place is a pedestrian safety wasteland. Uh, let's compare some other streets in Oregon City and keep in mind that Holcomb Boulevard from Redland Road east to the city limits is a distance of 1.9 miles with no traffic signals, no stop signs, and no crosswalks. Malala Avenue from Highway 213 to Beaver Creek Road, a distance of eight-tenths of a mile, has, or soon will have, five traffic signals and two crosswalks. Malala Avenue from Beaver Creek Road to Division Street, a distance of 1.4 miles, has four traffic signals and two crosswalks. 7th Street from Division to Singer Hill, a distance of 6 tenths of a mile, has two traffic signals and two crosswalks. High Street from Singer Hill to 2nd Street, a distance of 4 tenths of a mile, 
has five crosswalks. Warner Parrot Road, Warner Milne Roads, from South End Road to Malala Avenue, a distance of 1.8 miles, have four traffic signals and two crosswalks. Washington Street from 6th, 7th Street to Home Depot, a distance of 1.4 miles, has six traffic signals and two crosswalks. And now it should be noted that at most traffic signals, there are four crosswalks. The transportation system plan lists four crosswalks on Holcomb Boulevard. Most are placed in good locations, but the one at Oak Tree Terrace couldn't be worse. To the east is a road hump that makes the sight distance very poor for seeing pedestrians at that location. So we propose that crosswalk be located further to the east near Tracy Lee Court or further west to where the footpath emerges from Oak Valley Drive. <clears throat> Considering the projected increase in traffic on Holcomb Boulevard, we request that all four of the crosswalks in the TSP be constructed and be the pedestrian activated light type. Other areas of Oregon City seem well served by these safety features and the citizens of the Park Place feel it's their time. And we'll look forward to a timely response. Uh, I must say, I don't have this written down, but I must say that uh, it might be brought up that there is no warrants because there's no pedestrians uh, trying to cross Holcomb Boulevard. Well, of course they're not. They're scared to death. Who would ever want to try to cross Holcomb Boulevard? Uh, it's it's uh, and we what we're doing in the Park Place uh, area is we're trying to be pre proactive, get these things in before it's too late rather than to be reactive when all these homes are built and people are trying to get through all that traffic. So thank you for your time. <laughs> and uh, please remember that I was speaking as a representative of the Park Place Neighborhood Association, not as a member of this committee. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, then we have another person who would like to speak on this matter. Hey Bob, will you share? In, you'll share your written notes with uh, with Kim, so she can add those to the record. Uh, yes, I will. Okay. Um, go ahead and, uh, and we're still on uh, citizen comments, sir. Lisa Novak. on here. We'll find out if I'm not, right? Good evening, Chair LaSalle and committee members. I appreciate your time. My name is Lisa Novak and I'm a resident of Park Place. Thank you for this opportunity to provide comments to the Holcomb Boulevard traffic document. The configuration of the boulevard, of the boulevard is such that speeding is passively encouraged. Vehicles are roaring down the hill from the direction of Bradley Road, and posted speed limits are not followed. From the opposite direction, vehicles coming up the hill from the west speed up in the vicinity of Hunter and Holcomb because of the hill. Please keep in mind, because of this configuration, the hills, blind spots, along with the speeding, a pedestrian cannot predict a safe crossing. This includes school, children, and commuter, commuters crossing the road for the bus. Keep in mind, mailboxes are on the south side of the road. Park and sidewalk are on the north side, as well as the school. We are forced to cross the road. Coming out of your driveway on a garbage pickup day, it's, it's pretty scary. To keep my comments brief, I have itemized them in bullet form. On page 14, Exhibit 3 of the document, the map includes subdivisions only up to 2016. Since then, many more homes have been built, and how many more are planned? Here's a rhetorical question. Did I read correctly on the document that the most recent year of a Holcomb review, speed limit review, was in 1978? Did I read that right? Don't have to answer. 
Let's not forget the 2004 plan that was never implemented, or at least maybe 10 to 20 percent was. It was a beautiful plan. A lot of time and money was spent on it. On page 16 of the report, Exhibit 5, nearly all the red dots indicating folks that believe the speed limit should be increased or remain at 40 are either outside of Park Place or on the far outside boundary. I don't think those red dots should be considered the, the comments. The document does not take into account the near misses, the yellow double line crossing, nor the racing. The road, the configuration of the road invites racing. Let's also keep in mind, vehicles are getting larger and tend to creep into the bike lane, not to mention the boats and RVs. The document states that between 2013 and 2017, there were 21 incidents. 11 of those were inv involved injuries. That's someone's life being impacted. Also, the data does not include information from 2018 to 2019 and does not include the near misses. The document does not consider construction vehicles and their impact with the current construction, the annexation, and infill. It also does not take into account the future development of the county buildings, nor the apartment building currently under construction. The document states that Holcomb is used as an arterial. Of course, there are very few north-south streets. There's no way to exit the neighborhood without using Holcomb or Forsyth. Speaking of arterials, let's compare other designated minor arterials in Oregon City. South End Road, similar configuration as Holcomb with 35 mile per hour speed limit and traffic calming measures. Lynn Avenue, similar configuration as Holcomb, and the speed limit is varied from 25 to 35 miles per hour and does have crosswalks. Washington Street, north from Abernathy Road to Home Depot, the speed limit varies from 30 to 35 miles per hour, no residences, does have crosswalk and left turn lane at the end of the trail and Amtrak station. Abernathy Road, 35 miles per hour, and a left turn lane. Holcomb Boulevard, nothing. With all due respect, that the time has long passed to make improvements to this road. Now, I'm not able to mention this, but I will anyway. Today on uh, next door, if anyone is on next door social media, there are posts where a bus driver was passed and flipped off while the kids were disembarking from the bus. This is a, a routine occurrence. So again, I thank you for your time. Please help us. Please do something before it, something very serious happens. Thank you. We kind of inadvertently, uh, I'll be with you a minute, William. Uh, inadvertently moved into the new discussion on the Holcomb Boulevard corridor review. It was kind of a combination that just happened. Don't ask me how, but it happened. William? Excuse me, Mr. Chair. My name is William Gifford. I live in Oregon City. Committee member, I was going to make the point that the agenda says that citizen comments are supposed to be for non-agenda items. Yes. And your comments and Lisa's comments were specifically about a, an item on the agenda. I have comments to make. Should I wait to the appropriate time or should I? You should wait. And the citizen comments that we made that I started with were specifically in regard to crosswalks. They weren't in regard to the study of Holcomb Boulevard speeds. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, item five. Or does anybody have any questions or I think you comments? Have more he comments. had a citizen comment. Do you have any more? Any well, more does, any, does anybody else have a citizen comment that's on something that's not on the agenda? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next item is item five: new dis business discussion items. Five A: Oakham Boulevard corridor review. So Dana Webbs, our city engineer, she's going to um, present this uh, topic. So
So, I think you've all met Dana. If your slide presentation talks about why we're bringing this topic to them, but this was a request by the by the TAC, right? Um, uh, I think it was a request by um, some citizens. I'm not sure if it came through TAC, but there was emails to staff from um, citizens. Okay. I think we've kind of over the years talked with different groups of citizens about Holcomb. Um, and so what we opted to do was similar to what we did for Central Point Road a um, year and a half, maybe two years ago. Um, um, and so as, as you heard, Holcomb Boulevard is a minor arterial, and the in, intention of a minor arterial is to um, serve local traffic to and from those major roadways. Uh, so I just made a couple of slides that had some of the visuals from the packet. So this is a visual of the corridor. We're not, in, we're not getting them on the screen, sir. They're not part of the packet. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Okay. You have to look up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. They are, um, except for the one slide, they are all in the memo. Okay. I just thought it would be easier if we could all see the same image. So okay. um, included in there is a an aerial photo from 1999, which shows what the corridor looked like then. Um, as you can see, it was a a rural, underdeveloped area of the city. Um, this image shows that same area in 2018, which is the most current um, aerial photo that we have available. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you can see it's changed quite a bit. Um, new housing developments going in regularly. Between 1969 and 2017, we had 515 new single family homes built along the corridor with the majority of those occurring between 2000 and 2009. So those kind of give you a, a visual of how that corridor's changed. Um, pulling from the packet as well is um, information. Um, the city collects traffic um, data, both um, speed and volumes, every three years. And so I've pulled the information from 2011, 2014, and 2017. And so on these, images, um, the solid blue line shows the posted speed limit, and then the dashed lines show each of those three years um, what we call the 85th percentile speed. So generally the 85th percentile speed is um, that speed at which um, at or below which 85% of people drive uh, in a given location under good weather conditions and visibility and are, is considered the maximum safe speed. And so this kind of shows you that um, as we get closer to Redland Road, we see those 85th percentile speeds are lower. So as you're coming kind of through that, that tight curve and, and down the hill, um, but um, east of you know, Front Avenue, we're seeing higher than the posted speed limit for our 85th percentile. So ODOT uses that 85th percentile as a guidance for their speed limit setting. Um, this next slide shows, um, as was mentioned earlier, those volumes. So we have volumes going back a little bit further. So you can see that the corridor is seeing higher growth. Um, those um, ADTs over 9,000 are closer to Redland. As you get further east toward Barlow, we see much lower. Um, essentially, that's all those neighborhoods accessing Holcomb and going towards Redland. And so that's kind of what we um, see on that piece. So this is the one image that is not in the memo. So this goes with the crash da data. So these dots are um, the crashes in the corridor. So the reason it only goes to 2017 is that is the last full year that ODOT has published of the crash data. So it, it kind of funnels through the police departments, through to ODOT, they analyze it, and then they publish it. So that's the five years of crash data. 
So looking at the corridor, the blue dots are property damage only accidents. The yellow dots are injuries and where you see a red dot is a fatality. So you can see on the corridor, the majority of those accidents, which are listed out in the memo, happen closer down towards Redland Road. Um, there are, as you can see, a few here and there. So this is, this is an image not in the memo. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there were 21 crashes. Um, the majority of those crash types are rear end, um, likely due to lack of left turns, high speeds in the corridor, and in many instances, the crash data noted driver inattention. So that's the, based on the police report that's filled out. Um, those crashes tend to be during daylight hours and when the roadway is dry. So we're not seeing a large number of nighttime crashes or during rain. So during those times when it's dark or wet, people are likely driving a more appropriate speed, which would lend to less crashes. Um, hey Dana, if there if alcohol or drugs were involved, does that data show up here? Um, would it? Would that data it, show up here? It does. Have there is a place where it can be noted, and I think. I thought there was one that may have had a note, but I may not have put that in here. That's all right, I was just curious. Yeah, so when you look kind of through the, the full list of crashes, um, you know, you can see where it was um, noted if it was a single car accident. So, you know, property damage only where a vehicle left the roadway. Um, I think there was one where they hit a mailbox, another where they hit a tree. Um, but I did not look at the severity of the injuries. I just noted if there was an injury. So we put out a survey. Um, we shared the link to the survey um, through um, many of our committees. We posted it on Nextdoor and social media. Um, we got 262 unique submissions. Um, I say unique submissions because occasionally if someone hits the button twice, I will get two submissions. Um, I reviewed those and if there were duplicate email addresses, um, only counted that as one. I you caught me. <laughs> there were a few. Um, who knows if maybe they thought, oh, this didn't go through. Um, and then I did also check based on address. Um, and on those ones where we have duplicate addresses, I just did a very quick look to see if it looked like it was two different people from the same address submitting. So kind of just double checking those. Um, Almost everyone gave their address, which was helpful for the map um, showing that. Um, there were a few that chose not to. Um, we got the most responses from Nextdoor and social media. Um, so one of our reasons for collecting that information is so we know which of those outreach mechanisms um, reach the most people. So we can focus on those and work on that. So this slide shows those um, survey results. 106 of the responses wanted to keep the 40 miles per hour. Um, the 35 mile per hour had 63 responses, 59 responses for 30 miles per hour, and a few folks that would like to raise the speed limit. Um, although 25 miles per hour was not a choice, in the comment section, some folks did ask for it to be dropped to 25. So this is um, the same list of feedback that is in the memo. Um, you know, some people that like the speed limit, some that don't, various comments. Um, so I just kind of threw those up here so that you kind of had an idea of the, the type of feedback that we received. Um, and then this slide is kind of zoomed in so that you could see those color coding dots. And so you'll see on the west half of the corridor, and I kind of look at the corridor, that highest peak is the break point. So that west half um, generally, I think, supports a lower speed limit. Um, the east half, maybe not so much. And then you can see there are dots um, throughout the city from 
people that had uh, taken the survey. So this is sort of kind of that presentation of um, all the information. From a staff perspective, um, we would recommend um, asking ODOT to look at dropping it to 35 mile an hour, which is more consistent with our other um, minor arterials in town, but the survey results are another aspect of that. And so we're here tonight to kind of present that to you and get your feedback on if we proceed with asking ODOT um, to review the corridor or if we take the community feedback and, and say, we're going to stick with the 40. So we're, we're here to collect your feedback. Any questions? And a quick question. So we could request different speed limits. It's all 40 right now, but we could have yep. a section and be 35 and 40. Yep. We could just ask that they look at sort of the west end. Um, and so that is an option as well. We didn't lay the survey out to kind of pick that kind of level of detail. Um, but that's definitely something you guys could recommend. And if we just ask ODOT to do the whole survey, would they split it into sections? Or would we have to specifically tell them that we want to identify the lower west side or the east side? Um, if we ask for them to look at the whole thing and they only think half of it should be lowered, then they would make that. They would make that determination. For the, for the areas east of the city limit, is that uh, county-owned uh, property? Has the county engaged in this discussion about the speed limit setting? Okay. Um, I'm looking at the locations where the respondents were living. I see quite a bit, like Ms. No uh, mentioned, quite a bit outside of that area. It, how, how valid would those respondents be with a valid opinion of what goes on in Holcomb Boulevard when they live clear down in Gaffney Lane and areas like that? I mean, it, it's just a question that I would kind of wonder about. Yeah, so we didn't restrict the area to a certain group of citizens, so it was open to anyone yeah. to share. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's kind of up to you to decide, based on that feedback, your direction. It's been, it's been my experience, though, that um, the citizens inside the city and outside the city, on one side of the city or the other, have, uh, if they have an opinion, they choose to share it. And um, we don't decipher that. I think the map kind of speaks for itself. Um, our recommendation is to uh, pursue the, the speed study and pursue a reduction of speed. And a lot of that has to do with not just the survey, um, but you know years of community feedback, just like we heard before the topic was presented. And uh, I don't know, well, we got one more speaker on that, so I don't know at what point you want to listen to that. but. Um, you know, uh, I know I personally have been to a lot of neighborhood meetings where, you know, the, the, the desire is that the city advocate more for the neighborhood when it comes to speed. And, um, you know, I think our leadership is, is, is very interested in protecting its neighborhoods to the degree we can, and speed is one of those ways. And, and um, the, the concern I have, and I, I don't know if you remember on Central Point, we had kind of a similar concern, which was, <clears throat> well, what if they come back and they suggest um, a higher speed because of the 85th percentile? That was going to be my question is how much weight will ODOT give to the 85th percentile? Because that did look like it would warrant a higher speed. So are we going the wrong direction and asking for them for that feedback? Yeah, my sense is that I, I don't know. We, we, we do had talked today a little bit about reaching out to that ODOT. Because um, I think it's still just one gentleman who, who does those speed studies, at least one supervisor who oversees staff maybe that do those. But um, <clears throat> my sense is because of, I mean, the other thing that has been, the point that's been made tonight uh, uh, by, I think, both speakers uh, or both, you know, citizen comments was, 
it's not just what it is today, it's also, there is a fair amount of development potential there. So more side street connections and more um, crossings. And, um, you know, I, I, I think we could point out to them things like, you know, yeah, people have to cross the street to get to their mailboxes. And um, so that combined with the fact that, you know, I think any county road coming into city tends to have higher speeds, you know, and so is that really, really what we want for a more urban dense, dense you know, and I, I think that the gradient of Holcomb Boulevard has a lot to do with why folks maybe take so long to slow down or never slow down. It just kind of lends itself to that. But the question is, is really, if you had more pedestrian crossing activity, would that be a safe speed? Given some of the, I mean, there is, it is kind of a straight boulevard with the exception of that one large curve. But if you look at Holcomb Boulevard and the way it's developed over the years, it's got a lot of humps and high spots and low spots to it and um, ditches, et cetera. So I, I, I have a feeling that um, ODOT, with this information and maybe some input from staff, would, um, would be able to get to. A 35 mile an hour recommendation, but but does the 85th percentile doesn't kind of support that, does it? Does not. Mm -hmm. It didn't on Central Point Road either. But the city would have <coughs> the city doesn't necessarily have to go by ODOT's recommendation. They can go plus or minus their recommendation. I think it's 10 miles an hour. Yeah, Dan and I talked about that this morning. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but I think it was, I thought it was five. It was maybe um, five, yeah. But um, I, I, I believe that's true. We'll have to verify so that. So if their recommendation came back at 45 miles an hour because of the data, we're just right back to the same 40 mile an hour zone at, yeah. at best. Okay. It seems we can like check that <laughs> mileage piece um, before we ask for the, the study, but. So drop my kids in the morning at the Holcomb, and then I take that route down to uh, right 213. Or 213, yeah. I mean, you've got kids waiting for a bus. I mean, the cars are going quite fast down that stretch, so it doesn't seem quite the safest stretch of the road out there. I mean, you're, you're wanting people to walk, but then you're kind of making it a little bit sketchy. We're recommending the speed study, so I'm not sure. Well, I know, but the question, the question is, do you, do you have to, ha do you need a speed s study to regulate the speed? Yes. You can, city can take an action to reduce right. the speed right. without speed study. Yes. The, the exception of that is the, the new rule on the 20, to t taking a 25 mile an hour to a 20 mile an hour. But how does that work if the speed study comes at the 45 miles an hour? I think that's where that change in the corridor, so the, the slide where we look at um, 1999 and what it looked like, um, and then we look at 2018. And so with Central Point Road, our, our concern with that was we wanted to lower the section um, adjacent to the county but our 85th percentile speeds on our existing section showed higher than 35. And so we were nervous they might recommend 40. Um, and kind of in those discussions, it was, you know, the context of the corridors changed. Um, we're seeing, you know, different things. Um, kind of like we talked about in the memo, there's 20 side streets and over 50 driveways on this corridor, even at this level of development. And so they really start to look at some of those pieces as well. Will they take into consideration the concept plan and the number of homes that are being looked in addition in making their decision, or are they only going to base it off of the current data as of today? We can share the information with them. Okay. Because what I'm hearing is that a lot of it is not going to be, it's going to be 40 or 45 is probably what the information and data says right now, but I think what I'm hearing is comments from citizens and everybody else's we're all trying to look to lower it so is the ODOT plan really going to get that accomplished for us can, can we make it a safer street by by putting in more crosswalks which would net then which would then lower the speed I, I don't believe 
believe, I don't, I don't, I don't, know. I don't believe crosswalks will slow down speed unless you design a road to make it slower. Just putting paint on the road is not. No, gonna, I mean if they were yeah. pedestrian activated crosswalks. Um, well, they're not necessarily um, a speed control device. They're a safety right? device, which by a byproduct is the the cars slow down. I would agree the average speeds would go down if, if people were using those yeah. mm -hmm. because, um, in theory, those those crossings would slow cars while the crossing happened and the resulting data from that would be a lower speed. If there's no one using that pedestrian crosswalk, I'm not right. sure that right. the speed limits would drop. You'd like to think they would with the signage, but... Um, you know, signage isn't that effective. I don't Correct. think signage, more signage on Holcomb is necessarily going to uh, affect that. I think enforcement will. Or traffic calming uh, measures. You know, we're talking an arterial here, so, you know, we still got to, you know, make sure that we're providing lane widths that are wide enough for trucks, and we've got some places where we're constrained by existing curbs and ditches, so it's a little more... I mean, I, I'm, I we're, not, we're not. We would never see speed humps, for instance, mm -hmm. um, along there. We can. We could do more with, you know, like flashing signage, like what we put on uh, the curve. Um, we, you know, the county did do a road um, audit on Redland Road, and just looking at Redland Road in uh, particular, you know, things like intersection, the head signage. They did a lot of that, um, which I think is effective if you're coming up on, if you're unfamiliar with the road. The speed, can you go to the, the, the next slide, I think? You know, to me, this slide was kind of interesting in that um, there's not a bunch of traffic coming in off the county. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at averages, most of those speeders are living in the city. Um, you know, that's typical of what we see even in um, school zones. <laughs> um, the folks who are disobeying the speed limit, obviously there's folks in the county that are doing that, but um, lots of times in neighborhood traffic, the speeding that we see is, is at 7.45 to 8 o'clock when you know parents are taking their kids to school, which is kind of frustrating. That's kind of counterintuitive. You think they'd be the safest drivers, but often they're rushing to get the kid to school. They're late for school. And, and so... <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think the we can ask we we can ask some questions of the ODOT um, traffic study folks to make sure that you know that question about you know is there a couple of zones along this that we look at um, knowing that we have 85th percentile speeds. Uh, I think we asked this question when we when we did Central Point. Well, do you remember what their kind of response was, Dana? Was it? That's kind of where they take in that context of the neighborhood and those changes. Um, the last time the speed limit was officially changed by ODOT, um, I think 1971, um, no, 1978. Um, so it's been a while since they've looked at it. Um, they haven't seen the changes to the corridor. We had kind of the similar one on um, Central Point, and they did recommend the 35 for the whole corridor, where we were actually seeing 85th percentiles of the section posted 35, closer to 40, and so we were nervous they would increase the speed limit, and we were, you know, honest with them and clear that this we don't want it raised. We actually want it lowered. And so they took that into account. Okay. So previously, I um, on Central Point, I attached the whole memo as well as a letter from TAC that um, kind of provided that citizen input and community request. So if there was a letter from TAC and we wanted to pursue ODOT looking at the speed limit, then we would submit it with that request of 35. So in here you can see from from Redland to nearly Front Avenue does support that 35 mile an hour based on the 85th percentiles. Um, it's, you know, in, we could put a narrative with our request, it, you know, not to look at just the numbers, but to take into account um, what actually is in the corridor and what we see. I think the um, 
the other little piece that was reminded of tonight was the uh, Holcomb plan does have more desire for pedestrian activity and pedestrian improvements along the boulevard. Uh, that, that might be another piece of information that we referred mm -hmm. to you with our, with our review, but we think it makes sense to go ahead and pursue the, the study and advocate for the lower speed. I want to make one more uh, comment about the uh, county area of this project because the county recently adopted Vision Zero, which uh, basically wants to have zero fatalities and zero serious crashes. I don't know if the city has the same thing, but at least in the county portion, that they, the county would, uh, their goal was to reduce crashes and fatalities. So getting them on board with this project, I think would be uh, good because they want to increase safety as well. Thank you, Dana. We have two uh, citizen comments on this issue. Michael Ard and William Gifford. Oh, one more. No? Apply the B. Get one. Oh, okay. Thank you, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here, aren't I? Yeah, uh, so I just submitted a, a form for speaking on this subject and, and just because I had some uh, relevant experience that I thought uh, might be helpful to this discussion. Uh, specifically, uh, my name is Mike Ard. I am a professional transportation engineer with Ard Engineering, been practicing for over 20 years. And my experience actually includes doing numerous speed studies on behalf of the Oregon Department of Transportation. So I'm familiar with their process and their rules. and. Uh, what I wanted to shed a little bit of light on for you is how they determine the design speed for a roadway and establish speed limits. And they do have some very specific rules for that. And the rules actually vary depending on the roadway jurisdiction as well. Um, their, their rules have changed a little bit over time, and it has been several years since uh, I've done a study for them, which is why I pulled up their speed zoning manual to make sure that the information that I provide you is current. Um, what it does say in here uh, is that the primary factor in determining the recommended speed shall be the 85th percentile speed. So they do consider other things. In fact, their, their speed zoning manual has been updated to include that they consider citizen comments now, which is something that definitely was not the case previously when I was doing these. Uh, but they also have a, a very uh, salient line here in it that says the recommended speed shall not be reduced more than 10 miles per hour below the 85th percentile speed. Mm. So that establishes a minimum floor for the, the speed zoning. So if your 85th percentile speed is coming in at, say, 43 miles per hour, um, they could not go lower than 33 miles per hour, and they will not post a speed that is not at a five mile per hour increment, which means that could go as low as 35, but certainly could not go to 30 based on that data. And if you're looking at a data point that is uh, above 45 miles per hour, then you're looking at a situation where you can't lower the speed limit below 40. Um, I will also say that they consider both eastbound and westbound simultaneously in the, the speed studies. So where you're looking at discrete eastbound versus westbound speeds here, you'd have to kind of amalgamate those two to get an 85th percentile overall speed number to determine whether you believe it's likely that they could reduce the speed or not. But that's kind of their constraints. Again, I said it's a little bit different depending on the jurisdiction. I believe their rule still is that for an ODOT facility, they won't lower it by more than five miles per hour, but they give a little deference to local jurisdictions that have preferences for their roadways as well. Um, there is one other option that I have seen done, and I don't know whether it's something that could apply here. Uh, but as I recall, there uh, is some multifamily housing in the area, and I don't know whether it specifically qualifies as multifamily housing, but I'm picturing the development that is on the northwest side of Holcomb Boulevard in the vicinity of Holcomb Elementary School. So there's uh, some subsidized housing there, and, and I know there are duplexes in there. I don't know whether that qualifies by itself. I know that apartment buildings do. 
Uh, but when you have access to multifamily housing, that can be considered a residence district by virtue of that. And if they rescind the speed limit, then the speed limit in a residence district is by statute 25 miles per hour, which would be a very significant reduction. I don't know whether that's possible, but it is something that you could look at as an alternative uh, and at least explore whether that could be done uh, in that vicinity. It does sound like um, the, the western end of this corridor is the primary concern. I can tell you that I grew up uh, in the late 80s uh, out on Bradley Road, which was out toward the east end of, of the map that was shown there. And I rode my bike and walked on Holcomb Boulevard all the time. The traffic volumes were way lower, I'll say, at that time. Uh, but even then, I, I would actually, if I was riding my bike at night on the road, I would pull off of the side of the road into the ditch and try to hide myself in case a drunk driver noticed me and accidentally steered in toward me. Uh, so I was nervous about it at that time. I can just imagine what uh, people are going through now on that corridor, so I can sympathize with that concern. But uh, you know, if, if you're trying to, to lower the speeds, I, I just wanted you to be aware of those uh, opportunities and constraints as far as navigating the rules of ODOT, and, and it looks like you probably couldn't go any lower than 40 miles an hour, but it's, it may be possible based on the data that I'm seeing there. And thank you very much. It's good information. Yeah. Send me a bill. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> One other thing about the concern of 45 miles an hour, them raising the speed oh, okay. limit, I think that's pretty unlikely based on the speed data that I'm seeing here and the policy that allows reducing speeds by up to 10 miles per hour. So I don't think you'd end up in a worse situation than you're in right now if you explore it. Well, especially it's kind of encouraging that they consider citizen comments. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. 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 Kind of that's why we different. That's how we've changed Way our thing. ways since Central Point Road. That's fairly new yeah. requirement. But okay, our next item is five B Malala well, Avenue. Do we? Do we? Uh, so we put together a letter for you last time. Um, and I don't recall the, oh, that's did right. the chair sign the letter or how? Yeah. So we'd like to move forward with this probably before your next meeting. So uh, can we get at least a? A head nod or motion or whatever you want to do for us to write us a, a letter and then we'll have um, either Bob you or or, or um, Henry Henry yeah. um, Henry or Sedimar. Uh yeah we entertain a motion to have the city request a speed study on Holcomb Boulevard from Redland Road to the urban growth boundary to the east. Second. Mr. A quick question. If, question. If we had the county sign on, would this speed up the study? If there more, it wouldn't make any difference. I don't, well, I don't think it will speed up the study. Um, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure, given the jurisdictional differences there whether the county would do that uh, they might provide a letter of support I don't I don't know we had we had the same issue at Central Point Road did yeah, they we coordinated with the county okay. at that point um, but I don't remember specifically I know we just we talked with them about we're changing out our sign and that coordination of sign changing but I don't know if they were interested in looking at Central Point out in the county mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think it's necessary with the information that, that I recall being required for the submittal. <clears throat> uh, we don't need that. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passed, so make a letter. Okay. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Okay, our next item is 5B, the Malala Avenue Streetscape Project. So Henry, um, you know, at least I don't know, I don't recall if any of it, any others made it to our 60% project open house for the Malala Avenue project, but at that meeting he asked for our next tech and transportation advisory meeting that we present uh, that information. So I'm here to go through the project and um, Give me an update. 
So if you recall, this is about an $8 million project, 7.8 to be exact. Um, of that, we got a Metro grant for 3.8 million, and the balance of that is paid using um, Oregon City grant, uh, Oregon City uh, system development charges and pavement maintenance fees. We're also doing some utility work, so we're gonna tap the utility funds for some of that. So, and again, the project uh, boundary for the most part is from Beaver Creek Road to Highway 213. There's an exception, uh, two exceptions to that. On the 213 end, we're, we're doing our best to stay away from uh, the 213 facility because what we've heard from ODOT is if we get too close and start, uh, well, in fact, if we affect their detection, their signal detection on, um, on Malala Avenue, that that is likely to trigger additional signal improvements, including upgrading all the signal, the ADA ramps, and maybe even signal replacements. So we're, we're, we're gonna have to back away from that um, as best we can. We still have some striping changes there that we'd like to implement, but we don't think that's gonna trigger anything uh, with ODOT. And then on the other end, we're going uh, back to Colton, which is the entrance to the Safeway or Hilltop Mall area, and considering some um, lane reconfiguration there. But the original intent of the project was for, um, from Beaver Creek to Highway 213, included um, three pedestrian activated crosswalks and replacement of two signals. That scope has changed a little bit in the, um, well, the Colton, Colton to Beaver Creek Road restriping is kind of an ad, as is a signal at First Street. So, um, and, you know, there's, there's been a fair amount of outreach on this. The uh, open houses, I would say, the first one was somewhat effective. The second one seemed a lot more well attended. I think, they're, uh, I should back up, they're both effective. It was just not good attendance at the 30%. We had, a little, we had better attendance at the 60% and a lot more social media outreach, project newsletters. Um, I don't remember all the statistics, but I think we sent out over 900 newsletters to um, businesses and residents, property owners along the corridor. And um, there's, there's been some uh, interest in the project because of some of the things that we're proposing to do in there. Some of it's got support from the neighborhood, other ones not so much support. It's, it's kind of like the speed study on Holcomb. Some people want it faster and some people want it slower. Um, that's kind of true for Malala Avenue. One thing I'll say about Malala Avenue, which is um, it's a challenging corridor because of the wedge that you kind of, you know, Beaver Creek and Malala Avenue are the two main arterials through there, and they basically create kind of a wedge, right, with commercial in the middle of those. And then all the side streets are, it's a technical term, cattywampus to, um, to Malala Avenue, so that none of them are really squared up. So um, that combined with, you know, our intersection spacing standards, there was none of that back when that happened. That was an, o, on a, an old ODOT facility that kind of crossed through our community and then development happened how it happened. So um, there's a lot of compromises with this project that um, we wouldn't necessarily see in new development, which is, which, which makes, some of these issues where, you know, one person or one group would want something one way and, you know, or we work with our engineering group and they suggest that's uh, really not the right industry standard. So we've been kind of struggling through that a little bit. But uh, more recently, just because we weren't getting a lot of feedback through online surveys or in, through our newsletters, Dana's phone number, I think, is published in all those documents, and she's getting, she's not getting much in the way of feedback, so one of the suggestions that our city commissioners made, or one of our city commissioners made, was can we do a pointed, you know, knock, knocking on doors throughout the, the area, on the commercial side especially, because some of the things that we're proposing involve what we call limitations to access management or access management, and Sometimes that has an impact on the business because they're used to having a driveway there and we're suggesting, well, you can still have a driveway there, but maybe you can only make 
left turns mm -hmm. in and out of that driveway. And so we prohibit the right turns once you put a median across that driveway. So it has, um, I would say, had a little controversy to it. I think we're coming to terms with that and learning more and more about the the reality of what we can do along that boulevard in the right of way that we have. We are getting a little bit of right of way as well. I think there's 15 properties that we're getting right away where we need a little more. Um, you know, when the original property was platted, we didn't have. We didn't ask for more sufficient right away, and now uh, we're we're needing that. So, project characteristics is is this showing up on their screens? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Do the toggle. If they switch the toggle, it should go from agenda to the screen. There it is. Showing. No. No. Okay. So. Um, it's not the part of the packet. The. Um, so the project characteristics, obviously, um, one thing that we're going to show you is the, the restriping proposal that we're talking about between Colton Place, which is the Safeway entrance and Beaver Creek Road, and converting the two through lanes to, uh, two, there's a single northbound left and two through lanes that um, we would convert switching, yeah, southbound. Um, Walla at Beaver Creek Future northbound. Southbound, right? Should be, should be south. Yeah. Should be southbound. Um, so this, this, we, the dual left turn southbound would be implemented project. Right. There would be a future project that would implement the northbound dual left turn lanes. Right. Oh, to so going towards county. So we're going to talk about the southbound uh, turn lanes, but yeah, there's also. Um, a, a future need for northbound dual left turns as well. Um, pedestrian activated flashing mid block crosswalks. So we'll talk about those. There's three of them. Buffered bike lanes, uh, signal replacements, and lane reconfigurations at Claremont and Gaffney Lane. Uh, new traffic signal at First Street. <coughs> driveway controls and again uh, access management. Widened sidewalks, I think for the most part we're running 10 feet wide sidewalks on the, on the west side of the roadway. For the most part we're not going to be replacing much of the sidewalk on the east side. And then we've got a cross street banner proposed and um, a gateway welcome feature. Quick question on sidewalks, we have them both sides of the road for the full length of the project? <coughs> yes. Is it done? Yes. They already... Yeah, they already exist on the east side, the full length. They don't necessarily exist on the full length on the west side. So we'll be completing those and we'll, for the most part, they're all getting wider. Wide 10? Say that again. Wide 10 foot sidewalk? Um, well, 10 foot sidewalk includes um, a furnishing zone, which has got tree wells and oh. street lights and garbage cans and amenities like that. Uh, and then a pet path. So it's, it's really about, I, I, my sense is for a boulevard like that, we'd like even more width, but then we'd be in a more private property. So this, this piece is something that wasn't included in the original, um, in the original plan set. As we were looking at uh, the through traffic numbers, um, on Malala Avenue, a lot of the through traffic doesn't necessarily um, stop along the corridor. They just are headed uh, through Oregon City. And um, so in looking at just traffic calming along Malala Avenue and the fact that the Malala Avenue um, segment is a smaller segment than Beaver Creek Road, well, despite the fact that we get a lot of traffic on Beaver Creek Road, this um, proposal would, by virtue of conversion of one of the through lanes encourage traffic to use that turn lane. Um, that's, that's kind of what our traffic consultant is telling us. Um, we also think that during construction, um, this is definitely going to be a better solution to try and move traffic away from the corridor during construction. And we're thinking a lot of that change may play out after construction anyway. So, um, so we like this concept. I think what uh, we heard from the community concern about the 
southbound right turn onto Beaver Creek Road and vehicles wanting to make that turn but having to deal with pedestrian a pedestrian that might be in the way trying to make the, the cross across Beaver Creek Road. Um, so let me, I've got a pointer here, I think. So this crosswalk right here and the turning movement, trying to make that right turn would essentially, if there was a pedestrian there, have to wait for that and block that through traffic, which, you know, maybe not during construction, but, or hopefully not during construction, but, um, you know, when, when, when the project's all complete and we've only got the one through lane there, how much is that going to impact that through lane? And that's, I think that's a, a valid point. And so we are looking at the timing of when that change would have to, would, you know, maybe have a dedicated right turn lane there when that would, when that would be warranted. Um, because that would include um, a new signal pole and probably some more improvements to that intersection. Is there a possibility to separate a signal timing so motors go in one signal phase and the pedestrians go in a different signal phase they're not going both at the same time? There, there is that potential. Um, it's, it, you know, you, you compromise the efficiency of Correct. the signal, right? Yep. But there is that potential. And I, I'm not sure if the project team is considering that right now, but there, there's, there are options for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, so it seems to me right now the traffic that's going south on Malala before it gets to Beaver Creek, the left turn lane before it actually gets... backs up and blocks this street here. So it, it seems if you had more capacity for a left turn, if the one through here it could be, so you have two possibilities to go left. This middle one, I'm looking at those three cars here. The middle one could either go straight or left. So you can get more traffic where you have the red circle up at the top. Oftentimes you can see that the left turners are already backed up in that middle lane. Yeah, so we're proposing two left turns. Okay. Is, that, is that your point? Yes. Yes. I, I, for a minute there, I thought you were proposing that that second left could also have a through arrow and... Um, I only know of one place, and maybe Mike, Mike knows more, but Lake Oswego has that scenario, and it's not a very mm -hmm. okay. good yeah. situation. So both of those would be dedicated left turns. Okay, that's, yeah. That, and that what, we're, what we're trying to show here is just this definitely in the afternoon yeah. is... That was at 3.30 today. That was it. Okay. Well, you're busy today, huh? Oh, taking pictures. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> Is there, there's no video here, right, Dan? No. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, I guess this is, uh, so did you have any questions about that segment beyond? Is that proposed change going to happen at the very beginning of the project to try to alleviate traffic off of the route while right. you're doing construction? We've, we've actually talked about doing, requiring that to be phase, yeah, the first phase. 1.1. One point one. Yeah. about the, uh, with having more traffic going left on the Beaver Creek, that also helped with the transit route with Route 33, because when I'm riding it going northbound on Bald Avenue, the bus is turning left on the Beaver Creek, or having to wait for the two uh, through, st through streets, through lanes to come through, and they're having to, it causes backup for the bus. So I think that uh, I would also appreciate having this be two left lanes there, because that would only be one through, through lane to deal with. Just wanted to add that comment. And the other thing we heard from the community is frustration right here. One of them was, one of those commenters was um, was on our transportation advisory committee, or is on our transportation advisory committee. He's not here tonight, but Vance, uh, you know, this, this short merge lane right here mm -hmm. has um, kind of created some hate and discontent and a little bit of road rage right there, so. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another piece uh, I'm going to point again. This little median right here has been a, boy, a, a small point of contention. I think it's small um, because this prevents the right in and, and right out into this driveway, which is pretty heavily used. The traffic counts in this location are pretty high. And um, so the question was, is, you know, why do it? Or if, 
why not put yet another signal there? And, um, you know, our response is basically signal. Um, well, the other thing that this does is it helps provide a pretty long queue here because we don't have vehicles using that center turn lane that stacks back. We need as much capacity in, in this lane as we can to make that left turn onto Beaver Creek Road. And in, in the future, we, we actually anticipate needing yet another lane there, another left turn lane. So uh, that's, I don't remember the date uh, or when that was kind of projected, but what, what year? 2031. 2031 was when that was projected. So um, I'll be retired by then, so we're not going to worry about that. How's that? <laughs> um, and we want to accommodate this crosswalk here. So, uh, you know, doing that with um, the allowing the right turns out of the driveway with a pedestrian crosswalk there, we're trying to space these crosswalks to the, you know, where they make sense. You know, we're, we've got a lot of driveways, some of which only have really one way in or one way out. So some of those we're trying not to limit, you know, and yet still, you know, allow those pedestrians to cross. That was a big part of the grant, right? Was to try to get residents from the west side of the road to the <coughs> business district on the east side of the road. And so these are gonna impact our efficiency in driving down Malala Avenue just because if there's a pedestrian there, you know, they may have a green light, but we're gonna still um, provide for some safer pedestrian crossings. But the demand is definitely high there. I, I, there's not a time that we don't go to lunch and see you know, pedestrians crossing there kind of naturally, usually at a diagonal or sprinting across or doing something like that, but they tend to cross there pretty regularly. So um, we think that's the right thing to do. We think it'll help with the efficiency. It'll definitely, you know, I think right now when people exit from that driveway, they're, especially at the peak hour, they're doing it at a kind of a risky situation. If you're a bicyclist along there, you gotta worry about that vehicle turning wide as they speed kind of across the center turn lane and the through lane, the northbound through lane. So uh, again, we think that's a good deal. The other thing I'll mention on this slide that, or that's true for Gaffey Lane as well is um, this, this center lane is, um, is currently striped as a through and a left, and then this is a, a right only. And um, that's been problematic for pedestrians, so the pedestrian gets that um, a crossing signal, and um, at the same time the vehicle gets a a, a green signal that um, could happen at the same time. And so we're trying to provide a dedicated left turn there so that uh, the timing of that signal would be such that if a pedestrian had activated a pedestrian button and they would never see that, uh, there wouldn't be that conflicting movement. So we think that's, you know, we still got to worry about right turns we, and we're still advocating for pedestrians to always make eye contact with those vehicles before they step out there, even if they have a, a walk signal. But, um, you know, that's, that, that can be a problem too, right? Right turn, if you're in the crosswalk, that can be a problem. But it's, it's been more problematic as we've seen here more recently in Oregon City for that left turn movement. And the other thing is uh, buffered bike lanes. So it's not, a, it's not a huge difference, but there's a couple of feet of buffer between the travel lane and the bike lanes. And um, we're also doing a lot more with um, the green striping to kind of indicate the bike lanes. So we think that's an advantage. This slide just kind of shows that um, I know, while I know we're limiting that one driveway with uh, a median, there are many access opportunities for this shopping center. Um, there's been some concern because some of these back entrances only have this narrow little drive through between the buildings, but um, you know, there are other access points around that can, can be made there. So we think that's still a, a better option. Um, same kind of lane configuration to Gaffney Lane. Uh, both of these intersecting roadways, you know, again, we're kind of constrained. Uh, Burgerville in particular, I think we're still going to have to move some of their frontage there a little bit. But um, it's, it's pretty tight through those those lanes are relatively narrow 
and we're trying to accommodate bikes with sharrows and those kind of things. But um, and there's not much we can do with reconfiguration of those roadways based on the existing businesses. So we're trying to eke out as many efficiencies and safety measures as we can. What do you mean by sharrows point? I mean, like a uh, big gap in the buffer bike lane would we go from sharrows to buffer bike lane and back? Is that what you mean by that? No, I just, I, I, I'm trying to remember uh, Gaffney Lane, for instance, I don't think we have room for a bike lane there. So, um, especially when we okay. get to the so three lane street. section, so the side street. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. Uh, Gaffney to Fur is really mostly about, you know, there's that's the one section of Malala Avenue that really has got wide driveways, not very good sidewalks, or sidewalks that's pretty uh, polluted with power poles and other obstacles. Uh, and for the most part, it's missing across most of that frontage. And then First Street is another uh, signal that was um, really kind of warranted based on some of the backups that we have on First Street, and it provided yet another pedestrian crossing. So um, we've decided to go ahead and include that, or at least recommend that to the city commission to um, include that signal with this project. Um, we're, we're proposing a mid-block crosswalk here, which puts it 675 feet from the first street signal. This one was another point of contention. There's an existing crosswalk right there with a little island. So you've got the Wilco driveway coming out and you've got, um, Garden Meadow coming out and, um, well, we haven't had, as far as I know, we haven't had pedestrian accidents there, pedestrian car accidents there. We've definitely, that island gets hit all the time, so we've spent a lot of time putting up cones and things like that there to kind of better delineate that. It was a condition of approval when Wilco redeveloped. Um, we're proposing to allow, uh, the, there'll still be the ADA ramps there, but it won't be a striped crosswalk. And I think the neighborhood was a little frustrated with that in that they liked the idea of being able to walk down the street and cross here and go, if they go to Wilco, they're there, or go to the post office, or go to Fred Meyer. And we're now suggesting that if you're going to Fred Meyer or Wilco, you come to this crosswalk and you know you may have a little bit of a detour to get there. Uh, or if you're going to the post office, cross here and, and come down here. And uh, there are some driveways that need to be crossed, but we still think that that's the better option than having a pedestrian vehicle, high potential conflict area right there. Plus, uh, I think there was concern about the, I know there was, there was concern about that pedestrian crosswalk being too close to the signal. And again, uh, one more crosswalk, uh, trying to fit that in in a place where there's good sight distance as you come around the corner. Uh, aligned well with some of the pedestrian generators and some of the neighborhood traffic, so we've got um, we've got one more there. So there's some other considerations that are just kind of uh, being you know beyond all these features that we're adding um, or changing. We're thinking about nighttime construction, so there's residents along there that are going to be affected by that. Um, definitely have to have flagged. The, the whole roadway re section is reconstructed. So we're gonna curb to curb will be, I think I think it's like a 24 inch road section. I don't know if you've seen it lately, but it's pretty significant roadway section. And uh, so, and almost all of that roadway is built on something less than what we need. So we'll be digging most of it out. I think we were looking at some value engineering, maybe from Wilco out, we may not uh, be able to afford to do that, but definitely through the intersections, we're going to be doing that. Um, Are you guys planning to like recycle the and reuse some of that material out of like asphalt? And uh, the asphalt will definitely be recycled. Um, not uh, wouldn't be surprised if some of the road bases as well, but um, it you know. It, I don't know the answer to the recycling of the road base, but definitely asphalt anymore, also that gets recycled. Um, 
we're putting in signals, so, so signals sometimes are some pretty long lead times, and we're actually building an 18, 18 inch water line. Yeah. Um, pretty much from one end of the project to the other, so, you know, that, trying to deal with business access and making sure, um, cus, you know, their customers aren't, we're not losing too many customers to businesses, and then obviously access to the fire station and the post office. These are real quick, couple of concept designs. We really scaled back, I think. We've heard a lot of feedback of folks not necessarily that excited about landscape and medians. Um, so I think our median treatments for the most part are gonna be something similar to what you see on 99E where there's the um, exposed rock in the median. So it's cemented in, but it's kind of got a boulder look to it and not so much trees and landscape like that. But the, on this end, we're still hoping to kind of have a, a bit of a gateway concept there. And so I, th I think we're still considering either like more of a basalt wall concept or these metal panels. We've, we've kind of got some examples of metal, metal, metal panels that we've used in different projects. So I think both those have potential. I can't remember, did we land on a favorite? Okay, so we're headed towards the basalt. Uh, we had the open house in July. We're expecting 90% plans this month, final plans and bidding early 2020. And um, if we can get all that done, we'll be done by late 2020. So there you go. Is there a construction uh uh, plan for like access through it for bikes, pedestrians especially? Are they going to be sharing the road with motorists or having their own uh, separate area to go through this uh, construction area? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know that I can answer that right now. Obviously, we need to accommodate all the modes, and we're going to we're going to do that. Um, it's going to be a challenge in some places, but um, the fact that we're leaving the sidewalk it'll, on one side. It should be a little easier there, but there, it's going to be some tough spots, especially Gaffney and Claremont. But we'll let the experts help us figure that out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have two citizens that want to comment, Michael Ard and William Gifford. I think I'm on the right track this time. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so anxious to hear you talk, William. I just couldn't wait. <laughs> Again, Mike Ard with Art Engineering. Uh, I'm here actually representing uh, Craig Danielson because he was unable to attend himself. And uh, basically, they've got a successful business on the, the west side of Moala Avenue, um, north of Beaver Creek there. And like any good business owner, they're a little bit wary of change, want to make sure that it's not going to negatively impact them. And they wanted some reassurance that the design isn't going to create problems for them. <clears throat> so they hired me to review the design and analysis. And, and that really has been my goal is to, to either determine that this is acceptable and let them know that, or to um, point out concerns. Um, I haven't been able to have a, a detailed conversation with Craig as of yet, but I did review the study material that was put together by Kittleson and Associates for this, and there were a few questions that were raised in that process. Uh, I'll start by mentioning, just because uh, Bob mentioned uh, traffic volumes at, at the uh, intersection of Holcomb and Redland uh, in the vicinity of 9,080T and potentially doubling in the future. that. Right now, that intersection of Beaver Creek at Malala accommodates 33,315 vehicles per day, and that that is projected to go up to 43,520 in the uh, planning horizon analysis that was done for year 2040 conditions. So it is a, a pretty high volume intersection that we're talking about here. Um, things that I um, that, that raised questions in my mind as I reviewed the study. First of all, I, I saw that the count data that was collected for the project and the analysis was collected in November of 2018. 
And um, the reason that I point that out is that in November, you kind of get rainy conditions and a little bit dark conditions. So you may see a little bit of a suppressed pedestrian and bicycle demand versus summer conditions. And, and particularly for a project that's focused on bikes and peds, um, that may be a, a concern. Uh, there were some pedestrians and bicyclists that were observed in the count data. Uh, so it isn't completely absent that, but I wonder whether the, those volumes may end up being higher. And particularly as we talk about an improvement project that's going to make it safer and more comfortable to walk and bike in the vicinity, as we look into the future, I'd expect those November 2018 volumes to, as, to represent an extremely low estimate of what the future could hold in, in the year 2040. Uh, what I saw, though, in the analysis is that those numbers were stable, um, and, and it concerned me for a couple of reasons. The, the first is that as I look at the volume to capacity ratio, so the, in other words, the portion of the signal cycle that's, that's expected to be used for the southbound through lane going south on Malala Avenue through Beaver Creek, uh, what I was seeing is VC ratios that were projected in the vicinity of uh, 1.09 in the midday, 1.05 in the p.m., so a little bit over capacity. And as we talk about a shared through right lane, it's going to have some conflicts with pedestrians crossing in that crosswalk. So I wonder what happens when we succeed with this project and we have more bikes and we have more peds and therefore more conflicts there and we're already at over capacity for that lane. So we go to significantly over capacity when we, when we can't use the, the through uh, capacity of that lane because vehicles are stopped for those conflicts. With the single combined through and right lane, what that means is anytime somebody wants to turn right and there's a pedestrian conflict, they will stop and there isn't another lane for through vehicles to go around in. So they're just gonna stack up. Looking at the volume of traffic, uh, the projections show there's still going to be higher demand in that through right lane than what there is in the combined two left turn lanes at this intersection. So I do expect that the queuing would increase at this intersection as a result of the project. Part of that's intentional. I understand you're trying to discourage traffic from going down Malala Avenue and, and encourage them to, to make the left turn onto Beaver Creek and then onto 213, even if they're intended destination is out toward Malala and sort of the straight line approach uh, is the current natural route. Uh, the, the design does encourage by virtue of those two uh, left turn lanes people to take the slightly longer route and go around. Uh, but usually that doesn't happen until you get to saturation. Uh, so if they can't get through the other way then they pick a, a, a route that may be a little bit longer and a little bit less convenient. Um, one other thing, um, actually two other things that I noticed. Uh, one is in the comparison between the no build and the build scenarios for the year 2040, there's a, a strange discrepancy that I saw in the assumed cycle length. Um, under background conditions with no build, the cycle length for that signal varied between 100 seconds for the afternoon peak hour to 110 seconds for the evening peak hour. And under the build scenario, it was consistent at 140 seconds. So it seems like there's a little bit of an apples to apples uh, problem there um, that I'd kind of like to see the results for 140 seconds versus 140 seconds. A minor thing there. Um, much bigger thing is my concern about what happens when the pedestrian volumes go up. Um, and then the, the other thing was that this intersection is a high crash intersection as documented in the, the study. Uh, it does have the highest crash rate of any of the intersections on the corridor, and those are primarily vehicular crashes. Um, the reason that I raise that is because whenever I'm dealing with a high crash intersection, I there's, there's a part of me that's thinking, okay, are we going to make this worse or are we going to make this better? And, and how might we do that? Um, the concern that I have is that we have two southbound lanes approaching this intersection, one of which is going to be converted into a trapped lane. In, in other words, if you're in the left lane, you're going to feed into one of those two left turn lanes, whether you wanted to or not. 
Uh, and I do expect that there are going to be some people that are in that left lane, possibly not paying attention, just driving along on their merry way, used to be able to go straight through the intersection, and they expect to in the future too, and then they get to the intersection, and suddenly they see that arrow in their in their lane, and they think, well, I didn't, I didn't want to turn, so now at the last minute, they're trying to cut into what's already a crowded lane, or possibly in the intersection itself do emerge. So you may see some increase in side swipe type collisions within the intersection uh, by virtue of having the trap lane there. With, with this being a, a high crash intersection, I think that that's something that's worth looking at um, in a little bit of detail. As I said at the beginning, my primary concern in looking at this uh, on behalf of Craig Danielson is to try to determine whether it's going to create problems for him. Um, what I'm seeing right now and what I would have to report to him right now is that the the increase in pedestrian volumes likely means that the volume to capacity ratio that's already projected in the future to be more than one, in other words, more people trying to get through than what will actually fit, it may actually be worse than what's shown in the study by virtue of those added conflicts, uh, that the queues in that southbound through lane uh, are going to be much more significant than what you're seeing currently for that southbound left turn pocket. Um, and that that may cause some congestion along his frontage and difficulty in getting in and out of his driveways. Um, so uh, I, I definitely would be interested in seeing um, some tweaks to the analysis to, to accommodate, you know, what's the price of, of success with our project? Uh, what if we do see more pedestrians and more bicycles uh, on this corridor? What does it look like there? And make sure that the design accommodates that and make sure that we have something that's safe and functional for all users when we get done. Any questions? <clears throat> I just make one comment. You mentioned uh, <clears throat> vehicles trapped in the two left turn lanes that might be intending to go straight. Yes. And I think that's just a normal course of a traffic change. And it, people it, learn slowly that, hey, I shouldn't really be in this lane. Hopefully the locals future, are going to figure I'll, it out. I'll remember to be in the correct <laughs> yeah. lane. And I yeah. think that happens with every traffic change you have. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, we refer to it as a trap lane for a reason. Um, it, it's an unexpected um, forced turn yeah. um, for some people. And uh, hopefully as our GPS routing and things get better, people are going to be aware of that well in advance and be told, get in the right lane in order to go straight. So uh, hopefully that's going to be less of a concern in the future. Yeah. Mike, one okay. thing, I, I, I don't have the numbers, but um, the accident, uh, I know uh, right now that that um, left turn lane, the one that we're talking about, I think actually both of them, but they have the, um, they have the flashing yellow mm -hmm. permissive, um, and, and that at this intersection has, has shown some problems in that vehicles tend to follow one another without thinking as much about the oncoming mm -hmm. traffic. So there's so you're been, seeing turning an angle. We're seeing a lot there. of, yeah, T-bone crashes there. This configuration, while, you know, in a lot of cases I like those permitted left turns um, because they make things more efficient and you don't have to sit through a red light if there's no oncoming traffic. In this scenario, that option will no longer be permitted. So right. in theory, we should have less of those kind of accidents right. with this configuration. So I would agree with that. I, I'll say it again. This project is a, is a compromise in just about every segment. And, um, you know, the, the, the number, I hadn't quite heard the number stated, like you said, on, in terms of the, because I hadn't asked specifically about that traffic count at that intersection, but it does move a lot of traffic. And, um, and more in the future. So it's, um, that's one of the reasons why we're, um, we've asked Kittleson to look at this movement. I think, um, I think it was the brilliant William Gifford who pointed out this same concern to me. And uh, we kind of heard that pretty loud and clear. So I can't, we added the scope, we added some scope to Kittleson's effort to look at that dedicated right turn lane. And you know, figure out: do we really do we really have to take that on now? Mm -hmm. um, because it it it's, it's probably likely to be you know yet another major signal cost that we hadn't.
planned on, yeah. like the first street signal, you know, and can we, you know, see how this goes and deal with that maybe in, you know, 10 or 15 years. I don't know. So we'll see. I don't know that we've seen that result yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't had a chance to look at where the signal poles are yet either, they're, which is they're a, right in the f- at figures. <laughs> <laughs> they usually are. <laughs> so so um, conversion good. of the southbound dual lefts can happen with minimal changes to the traffic signal. We don't need to move the poles. We Dana, have a could you get to a mic? So they can, oh, good idea. Um, so the, the dual southbound turn lanes can be implemented pretty easily with um, minor changes to the traffic signal. It's changing the, the through head to a left turn head and changing the striping. Mm-hmm. The dual northbound lanes that we mentioned, that project isn't anticipated to be needed until 2031, and it also requires that we change out the length of the mast arm, which is the arm that hangs over traffic, mm-hmm. because we need to add those additional signal heads. Mm-hmm. So that has impacts to the signal pole that's located at the Texaco. And because we don't need that today, we will build the pavement. And that's why you see that wide yellow striped section. So when we come back, it's merely a change to the traffic signal and changes you know, to those kind of things. Mm-hmm. It's a, a signal project. And so what I anticipate is when we get the results back of the need for the right turn pocket, if it's warranted that those two items, because that would necessitate the moving of the signal pole at the corner of the bank, that those two could be combined into a future project that address those needs that we don't need today, but we know we'll need in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a project that we would include in our CIP list and program for future years. So we can, we can solve some of the problems today and we can look at how we fix the remaining ones in the future. Yeah, so that uh, project that she's talking about, the dual northbound left turn lanes will actually change the operation from the numbers that I gave you as well. Yeah. Uh, the volume to capacity ratio would decrease to 0.97 during the midday and 0.99 during the evening peak hour. So just barely within capacity for that southbound through lane uh, once the, the dual left turn lanes are are installed. And again, that's for your 2040 conditions. Um, but it's, it still has that concern regarding potential increased conflicts with bikes and peds, which might mean that that 0.99 is a little overly optimistic and maybe we're going to be over 1.0. So uh, if you're having Kittleson explore that right turn pocket, I'd, I'd also ask them at the same time to consider, you know, what's a reasonable estimate of growth in ped and bike volumes that we could put in there, um, both seasonal, since we're talking about taking November numbers and turning them into maybe summer peak numbers, uh, and then also looking out, you know, 20 years of growth at 1.5% is what you assumed for, for motorized vehicles. So that could be a, could add up to a significant difference in the ped bike volumes uh, as far as analyzing the need for the southbound right turn lane. So Mike, the, uh, we'll, we'll definitely try to articulate this in through the recording. I don't know if, I don't know if you've written any of this up and I to... haven't yet. I'm, I'm, thinking that my client is going to want me to do that anyway, though, (laughs) so I can definitely get that to you. Yeah, if you want to share it with us, and we're happy to share it with Gilson. They've been real helpful with this so far, so. Yeah. I have one thing that I'd like to uh, get more data on with what you're saying with the, uh, with how rerouting people on Beaver Creek, you're saying how they're trying to get on to 213. I thought they were going to try to be on Beaver Creek and stay on Beaver Creek, go down, you know, because... New Beaver Creek development is going on the east side of east side uh, CCC and going to the Beaver Creek community down there and the commuters into that you know that area. I thought that one reason why we're trying to do a you to go left on Beaver Creek so they can go down Beaver Creek, continue down it, not to get on 213. So that's that's one thing. I'd like to if there's any data to show which route they would use, whether they're going to continue down Beaver Creek or they're going to 
uh, take a left on Beaver Creek and take a right on 213. Well, there, there's a change in the traffic volumes where uh, about 150 vehicles off the top of my head are converted from going southbound through to making the southbound left turn. And unless those people were going through the Clackamas Community College campus to arrive at their destinations on Beaver Creek, I think it's unlikely that those are vehicles that are destined for that area. There will be increased development in the Beaver Creek area that's going to increase the, the volume of left turn movements, but that wouldn't correspond to a decrease in the through movement unless we're seeing a diversion of trips that are actually trying to go south on 213. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, well, uh, again, gonna... the, the, the number that uh, Kittleson was sharing with us, I don't remember, but it was a you know, reasonable volume. I think they assumed like 20% or 25% of those would start you know, using that as opposed to going through them all. But their, their route is, is Lino area further south on 213. So it's unlikely that they okay. would go through on Beaver Creek Road when they're really kind of headed right. um, south on 213. So they okay. would make the right at Beaver Creek, which yeah. is a, a low count movement for that intersection. Okay. Um, but still, I mean, this stuff always surprises. I, we've, we've, we've clearly got you know, congestion at Beaver Creek and 213 as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's just sometimes moving, trying to eke out as many efficiencies as we can on these facilities when we're really pretty constrained. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, you know, John, you pointed out before our meeting, uh, the, the likelihood that vehicle counts would in the future go down, right? So yeah. maybe maybe that's what the, the, the thing that we're aiming for. But William, you probably have something brilliant to say. I'm waiting for the chair to recognize you. <laughs> yes, I, see there? I was just going to say we get to, we need to move along here. Uh, yep. Mr. Gifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee members, my name is William Gifford and I still live in Oregon City. Um, before I before I address my, my, my regular presentation here, I, the solution I think to this is what I always come up with is a roundabout. God, I would love to have a roundabout there, and then all this would go away. Okay, with that said, <laughs> I just love roundabouts. Um, I want to point out that I, I feel like I have some standing regarding this, uh, this project insofar as um, uh, a lot of people worked hard, and I, I worked on the political aspect of, uh, of getting this uh, 3.8 million out of Metro, and, um, and John knows well that I was uh, instrumental in that, getting that through, C, uh, through C4. The, the original aim of the project was uh, Molala from Beaver Creek to 213, and as John opened his, uh, his statements, that has expanded. I don't know that, has Metro been told that the monies that they have given us um, for Beaver Creek to 213 would now be beyond Beaver Creek. And maybe not much of that money is going to be required other than some paint. But um, I also want to point out that this, this particular piece of the project was not mentioned at all at the 30% uh, design stage uh, in the open houses, uh, or the, open, the big open house that uh, some of us attended, not everyone. But uh, it was sort of sprung upon us uh, at the 60% uh, design phase. And there was no uh, consultation. There was no public process. There was no neighborhood association review. Uh, I want to point out that I am speaking for the Hillendale Tower Vista Neighborhood Associations, of which I'm the land use chair. Uh, but there was not really a public presentation as to this particular part of it until that 60% design. And I think a lot of people didn't realize that this was extending the project somewhat. somewhat. Um, I also want to point out that this, the, the piece of Molala between uh, Beaver Creek Road and Warner Milne, if you can picture that, and none of your pictures went that far down, uh, but that's the only four-lane section of Molala. As you, re as you remember when we did the 7th Street improvement, so there's four lanes there, you can count them. 
Um, when we did the 7th Street improvement up coming up through Molala, we took that from a four lane to a two lane with a, with a middle left turn lane. And when you get past this intersection, going farther south, it will again be a three lane basically with a, with a middle left turn lane, right? So it's a two lane with a middle left turn lane. This two block section is really um, uh, the only section, and I, I, I thought it was odd that it goes from two lanes to four lanes to two lanes. It's kind of the opposite of what they're doing on 213, where we're going from four lane, two lanes to four lanes to two lanes. Yeah, I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, this, this photograph I'm concerned a little uh, slightly disingenuous. Um, I was on this very intersection. I mean, I drive this daily, uh, a half an hour before this picture was taken, and it didn't look like that. As a matter of fact, if you would go back to that previous slide and understand that this map is superimposed upon an actual photograph, I don't think that's an, that's an artist's drawing in the shadow relief under there. And you'll see the number of cars that are in that left turn pocket. Not, uh, not extensive. I was looking on Google Earth, uh, and their photographs are very similar. That It's not always backed up, and I've never seen it backed up past Colton. <coughs> and again, I drive this daily. Um, so the proposal to put a two-lane uh, two left turn lanes there eliminates one of the through through southbound lanes and makes it both through lane and right turn lane. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about pedestrian traffic, but even someone turning right onto Beaver Creek, if there was no pedestrians, is still going to slow down, which slows down everyone in that in that queue. And we saw a similar situation uh, just in the last couple of months at the disaster, um, at um, which backed traffic up all the way down the hill at the intersection of Warner Milne and Molala when they were putting in the uh, the emergency care center, and the fiasco of them having to build a little uh, retaining wall around the outside of it, and then they closed the traffic, and people that were trying to turn right off of Molala to go down Warner Milne, stopped everybody all the way back up there. And again, that's just a one lane down there. And it was one of the most inconvenient traffic situations that I've seen in Oregon City. And I think I've seen a lot. So I'm concerned about not just the pedestrians, although that's a concern also because that stops things, but it's still going to be a slowdown for the right turn traffic. I'd rather that there was a right turn lane there. The, um, the problem seems to be to defer the traffic from going on to Molala. So if we want to make it easier for people to go down to, uh, and I appreciate Mr. Atkinson's comment about future development out uh, on the uh, employment areas across from the college and so on. If this is supposed to make it easier for people to go that way, that's an argument that I hadn't heard before that, that I think has some, has some merit. But the argument that it's going to reduce traffic on, Warner, uh, on, uh, on Molala uh, doesn't, doesn't cut it for me. There's still going to be traffic that wants to go to the college, that wants to go to the post office. Uh, that needs to go to the fire station for whatever reason. There's businesses all along there and the church and so on and so on that people are still going to be needing to go that way and having two lanes taking them off of where they want to go is not going to reduce their need to continue on southbound on Molala. So I'm concerned that taking a, a lane away from them is, uh, is going to bottle things up, especially since that same lane will be used to turn right. So, um, and I hate to sound as rash, but it does sound as though this is a solution that's looking for a problem. But, and there, it seems as though there could be some other alternatives that would not be that drastic, I don't think. If you look at this map again, you'll see that there's a, a through lane, which is also a right turn lane at the bottom. 
two left turn lanes, but look above that, there's still two lanes there. There's no reason to have two lanes there. There's really no reason to have two lanes there because it's just going to go down to one lane a half a block later. So why have two lanes above there? If those left turn lanes were moved over a little bit, maybe you'd have room for a right turn lane at the bottom and a through lane. But it does seem odd to me that there's two lanes up there. Um, when it's coming from one lane, going northbound from Molala, I mean, there's a... And, and they're wanting to put, eventually, two left turn lanes northbound, which is still going to leave only one through lane coming northbound. So why would there be two left lane, two, those two lanes there? The only argument that's, that's been proposed to me is that, well, you can't have traffic coming northbound off of Molala through Beaver Creek and then make a slight jog to get into that far right lane. I don't think that's insurmountable. I've seen much worse intersections. So it seems to me as though if, if you're convinced that you need two left turn lanes there, there ought to be some other solution than what this proposed is. And what I'm asking is that you go back and look and see what other possible solutions, because I haven't heard any other possible solutions. I'm not asking for a roundabout, but something other than using that one lane for through traffic which will be slowed by any right turn, whether there's a pedestrian there or not. Because I don't think it's going to achieve the desired effect of lessening traffic on Molala, whether it's construction time or any time. It's just, um, I don't think it's going to solve the problem that's, that's perceived. I'd like to see some other solutions. Thank you, Mr. Gifford. <coughs> I'll start by saying that's a very interesting proposal. I think it has some validity to it. Those two lanes over there go for two blocks or three blocks? No. Half a block more. Well, okay, they go two from blocks. Beaver Creek to Warner Milne. Yeah. And whatever length that is. Two blocks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that sounds kind of weird. Um, the, my response is, and I could be wrong about this, but Kittleson, we've asked Kittleson to look at the, um, the idea of the right turn lane, whether they're looking at the overall intersection because they are trying to plan for that future left turn lane, northbound left turn lane as well. Um, you know, they have been, uh, the innovators on this project, and we can share with them that suggestion. I want to. I want to say that we have talked about that, and I'm trying to remember what the maybe. Dana, do you remember any outcome on that? I, uh, we would have to redo the existing signal poles and mast arms to accommodate the signal heads. We we, we we would definitely have to do that. Could that you know when could that happen? But I agree, it's, it's, it's an interesting piece of, um, where you've got basically three lanes on either side of it and um, five lanes on the other side. Um, you know, the same argument could be made, this goes to three lanes in just, you know, less than a half a block. So, um, but, it wouldn't, but it wouldn't be that right turn concern, right? But we do, we do see problems with that. We're pretty sure that trying to move the lanes to align to accommodate the future to um, northbound left turn lanes. If we do that, we would lose this kind of yellow striped area right here, right? And that's where that future left turn will be. Um, so I mean, I'm a little bit, uh, it's interesting to play this out and design this in this transportation advisory committee meeting. I guess my <laughs> thought is good ideas, good discussion. I appreciate the details of that and the thought. Uh, we're happy to share that with Gilson and let him work through it, but I don't think we're going to solve that tonight. And I, you know, I just want to make sure if we ask them to do that, that, and their answer is 
no, stay the course, that, you know, that's the problem that we've come up with on some of the other issues is like, well, that's just what the engineer is. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't is, be able to make a presentation to the neighborhood associations. Yeah, or provide the data, right? Provide the no, data. there should be some conversation. There's, okay, just recognizing that there's costs associated with doing that as well. So. Costs associated with not doing it. I will say I went to neighbors who should mean last week it was, I believe, at Gaffney Lane. I live in the Gaffney Lane neighborhood, and this project was discussed there. So I just want to clarify that there has been discussion about this project at neighborhood association meetings because I've been attending them. So I just wanted to put, point that out. The, uh, William, the, the, the project scope doesn't include a 90% open house, but there's um, if, if we're talking about needing to provide that specifically to the neighborhood or to tack, I think that would be, given the amount of discussion we've had with it here, I'd, I'd rather have them come and express that to TAC. Would that be, <coughs> so does that make sense to you folks? Because I think that's um, the right audience and anybody from the neighborhood that wanted to attend could come and hear that. If we're gonna spend that kind of money for an, uh, for an additional meeting time. Well, all due respect to the experts, Kittleson and Associates and whatnot, um, they have a, a whole lot of real brain power working for them, but occasionally, as in every case, a plain old down to earth, plain old citizen. I'm not accusing you of being down to earth or anything. But <laughs> old, <laughs> but you know, they sometimes come up with a kind of an innovative, maybe not thought of or pursued strong enough idea that's, I think that idea is worth uh, them looking into. Yeah, really I do. think I think I've said that we will have them look into it as yeah. well about how to present it. Yeah. 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 Well, I think this could be a right medium and then people could attend that. Mm -hmm. and it's also a recorded meeting. People can yeah. hear it if they want to look at it later. Yeah. Okay, anything else on that subject? Okay. Now if I can find my agenda among these all these crazy notes. Uh, public works report, item 5C. Uh, so I don't have any presentation necessarily on the flashing beacon at Malala and Barkley Hills Drive other than to acknowledge that we've, um, it's, it is our intent. We've talked to the neighborhood about um, taking the existing crosswalk at Malala and Barkley Hills. And we've done uh, some work, which was we removed a couple of street trees, and I think we added some signage there to indicate pedestrian ahead. But the long-term plan is to add up uh, again another one of these rapid flashing pedestrian beacons at that location. I, I talked to the neighborhood about it, and I uh, let them know that that was our intent. It still is our intent. We just haven't made a lot of progress on it. So uh, we've got we've got a uh, a new engineer that's starting on Monday. They're going to take over a lot of the Malala project as well, but we think that that might be, that engineer or another engineer might be good to uh, get a little break. We're seeing a little slowdown in the development side of the house, so we may uh, point one of those engineers at that little project. So just know that that's still in, the, in our interest to get accomplished. Vance is going to talk about the Malala Avenue and Pearl Street study. Gentlemen. I'm not just going to sit here all night. <laughs> uh, good conversation, by the way, from everybody this evening. Uh, I have two quick things. Uh, Malala and Pearl, uh, where we uh, had the fatality and then the injury to the young man on the bicycle, well, pushing his bicycle. I want to let uh, the board know that um, right about the last TAC meeting, uh, myself, Dana, uh, Jason Thornburg, transportation manager, met with the county to have a discussion about you know, steps moving forward. Uh, at that time, it was decided before we just made changes that uh, in light of this intersection that we needed to do a, a proper uh, uh, road study or traffic audit on that. So we hired DKS to perform that duty. Um, they uh, have been to the field uh, to collect data uh, a couple times. Uh, Dana, myself, Jason Thornburg met with uh, DKS and the county again uh, a week ago, week and a half ago. 
Uh, they presented just some concepts of what they are going to propose in their final draft uh, for improvements. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly some low-hanging fruit there uh, that are inexpensive and easy to implement. Um, some things such as potentially uh, removing some parking stalls and uh, restriping the intersection, possibly a bulb out on the west side of Malala um, Pearl, uh, some things like that that are a little more expensive uh, and a little more into that. They uh, told me today that they'll have a draft ready for myself, Dana, John if he wants to, uh, in the county to look over and that the final draft we should have in about two weeks. So what I'd like to propose is uh, have present to you folks that final draft uh, at the next stack meeting. And, you know, I was thinking too, if, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask DKS if they'd like to do that presentation. So that's where we're at on the Malala Pearl traffic study. So some good, some good work from DKS. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but I uh, uh, can't say it enough. Um, you know, our partners at the county, especially in uh, signals and traffic, um, just have really been outstanding to work with and, and a very good help uh, for the city in that regard. So, uh, lastly, um, the Kanima 20 mile per hour family friendly zone update. Uh, you may or may not know there were some PMUF projects in that area. There was overlay, some slurry seal. Uh, that's all completed now as of about a week ago. And uh, Jason and his staff, they have the thermoplastic, they have the signage, they have the plans. So as weather permits, uh, they'll be implementing those uh, traffic uh, markings and signs in that area. Okay. okay. Any question on either? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item is future agenda items. Does anybody have anything they want to put on future agenda? I believe my topic's already been put on the new next agenda from the email that I saw, so I'm good. Thank you. There was, um, and I thought I wrote it down, um, Christina Robertson Gardner is, uh, wants to present at our October meeting on the Beaver Creek Road, what are we calling it? Concept oh, design? Concept Beaver Creek concept Road concept yeah. design, um, which is more about, um, it's less about all the zoning and, and um, land use actions that are happening on there and more about um, what Beaver Creek Road could look like in the future. So um, so she would like to come next month. Yeah, so. that'd be interesting as long as she keeps it to traffic and not all that other <laughs> stuff that's going on out the there. Rear Merle. Well, <laughs> it is Christina, so we'll give her that well, message. Well, let's and... keep her under control. <laughs> If you don't, I will. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I'm curious. I, I presented our argument for the crosswalks in Holcomb. Uh -huh. What is our next step to get that done? Uh, well, um, money. Yeah. <laughs> we need some money. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to spend the money somewhere. Yeah, I, I, I would say... Um, the good news is, is they're all in the transportation system plan. Some of those are are um, likely to be a requirement of future development. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember where all of them are located, but some of them are in pl places where we've got existing curb and sidewalk. I'm thinking of the one down from the school. That one would be a relatively straightforward one to the deal one with. The one on Swan, Swan would be, yeah, like Swan. Is there sidewalks? The is there sidewalks, sidewalks on both yeah, sides there's of Swan? Yes, yes. there. Yeah, yeah there yeah. are. Um, is there a development going in on that corner right now? No, that's Hunter. There were a few that's houses Hunter. on the southwest corner. There were a few houses okay. went in there. Yeah. So I, I don't want to answer that tonight necessarily specifically, but I, I mean I I hear you loud and clear. The um, the money piece that I think. Um, is probably being spoken for more than it actually is, but you know we've got um, the the county implemented their uh, vehicle registration fee, 
We're going to start seeing funding for that come in. We're wanting to utilize that money for projects that don't necessarily, um, they aren't necessarily adding capacity. So like those, those crosswalks, I don't recall whether or not there's, I think there might be 39% of those would be SDC eligible, which means we could use the SDC pot for that. Although we're spending that pot down quite a bit with this project and the Myers project, but there may be some funding for that. But the other piece, the thing that we liked about the vehicle registration fee is that it was a mechanism for funding kind of the unfunded portion, which is the non-growth piece, right? So um, there's a lot of projects that we're talking about trying to fund that uh, with. I think the Gardner School project where the school district is doing some things, there's going to be some projects that they won't, we won't be able to require from their, um, there will be some projects that we probably will be able to require of their development, but there will be some other things that won't be required. So we, we really are kind of focused on that area. And, and, and um, there's been a, I get asked probably weekly about how we're going to move forward on the roundabout at, at uh, Warner Parrot, Lynn, Leland. That's a big project. So dealing with some of this low-hanging fruit, I know Dana and I have talked about, could we do, could we pursue a grant to get maybe all those in, installed, all those pedestrian crosswalks installed, especially where there's not development potential and the sidewalks exist so that we don't have to worry about that. But maybe oh, Dana's probably got a better answer. I'm gonna pop in just super quick. Um, the kind of how you saw with the Malala project, that plan was done in, 1999-2001, so it's, this has been a long haul to get the Malala project in this last phase. Um, the 2005 Holcomb um, pedestrian plan was done, and we've made a little bit of progress. We got super close what, seven or eight years ago on a grant. Um, with the HB 2017 Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Fund, um, the Holcomb Corridor is our most promising corridor for that grant funding program. Um, and so in next, I don't remember if it's summer or fall, is the next deadline for that Safe Routes to School infrastructure program. And we would be targeting the, uh, the Holcomb corridor for a Safe Routes to School infrastructure grant. So, there you so that's our most likely opportunity. So um, we'll be reaching out to the neighborhood and the school district um, as we kind of take that 2005 plan, the grant criteria, and we create a project from that plan that meets that criteria that will score well. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be looking to the neighborhood and the school district and you know maybe the PTA at the school to provide letters of support um, for that grant application. Could you use as local matching some SDC money then that would go with that grant? Yeah, we'd probably use some SDC, some vehicle registration, some gas tax, that, all those pieces. Where is the county with the with that vehicle vehicle registration? I thought that was also being opposed or going back on a ballot or not that. No, it's that's passed. Not moving forward. It never yeah moved forward. I don't think we've seen any payments yet. There was some time. Yeah, you know, it doesn't start until January so 2020. Yeah. So that's when they start collecting fees. Correct. Right? Okay. So yeah. then there'll be time after that. Yeah. Right. So you know, it's not quick enough, but it never is. Okay. Well, we're feeling neglected. Hey, quick question. Do you now? Do you feel a little sorrier for us? <laughs> We just Volcom had to find Park the right grant Park program place. for you. Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, that would be wonderful because the people look at other areas and they think, why not us? You know, mm -hmm. You've got a, a new nice flashing thing there at the library on 7th. And, you know, that happened a few years ago. You've got new traffic signals on 12th in Washington. And, and, you know, all these things happen around, yet you've got a long, long corridor with no safety provisions you said that grant application is in the spring, did you say? Summer, fall? Yeah, summer okay. or fall. Okay. Our, our new staff member will be assigned to that, so he'll be digging into those criteria, looking back on previous um, projects that were awarded the grant, finding what helped them score well. 
Okay. If you could send some information to me explaining that, maybe I can go back to the neighborhood and give them at least some hope. You know what I mean? At Something to grasp onto rather than, hey, we're talking, but we're being ignored again. You know, that's what really happens. I know that's the perception, but it's definitely well, not the action. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, 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 uh, I'll be polite, John. You can talk about perception, but that is the fact of life. You know, that's where the people, what the people are looking at is their, their perception of how they're being treated and how they're being listened to. So if you can provide us information that says, hey, they're thinking about us, I'll certainly pass it on to them. We, in fact, we have a general meeting next month. If I could have that, some ammunition to pass on to give the neighbors some hope. But there's there's subdivision that just won in off the Holcomb, and I'm sure they were paying SDCs. Why some of those funds couldn't be redirected to these crosswalks? Well. Um, Again, there's a possibility of that. We've got a two-year adopted budget. That's not in that two-year adopted budget. Could it be redirected? Possibly. Um, or, you know, does it make more sense to wait until we get a grant that funds the full project and then we pair some of that money, we can budget for that and, you know, move forward accordingly. That's how we did Malala, right? For Malala, it's been... It's been a multi-year effort to save money and, you know, yeah. stock away money. These things, um, I mean, Hol Holcomb, uh, I think the neighborhood would also agree that it's not just crosswalks. They might see that as a shimmer of light, but I've heard, you know, they'd like more sidewalks, mm -hmm. right, as well. And so, and the last, really, the last neighborhood grant that we applied for was for Holcomb. And that was, um, that, that, package is still out there um, and we've talked about other options like like um, it does require a little bit of neighborhood um, buy-in in the form of you know but there's local improvement districts that's mm -hmm. another way to fund projects like this John you've talked about that plenty of times to me which is where you know we you know get buy-in from the neighborhood to fund a project that um, you know, there's usually some seed money to help on the city side of that as well. But it's it it then you know you define a project, you define a group of folks that would help contribute to that, and you form a local improvement district. And I know I've talked to at least two different neighbors on two different occasions who have asked the same question. And you know, at the time we're saying, well, that that's an option, and they kind of get excited about it when they talk about it on the phone. We send them some information and then we typically don't hear from them again um, because it requires property owners to buy in, to actually spend something out of their pockets. Um, and so... What is the estimated cost on one of those flashing uh, pedestrian activated lights going in? Well... The TSP we, states for each one of those crosswalks $35,000. But it doesn't say whether they're flashing lights or just plain crosswalk. It, it, yeah. it kind of depends. You know, there's certainly the set cost for the, the posts, uh, the uh, push buttons, you know, the hardware to make that system run. Um, but then if it triggers ADA, where you're into replacing ramps, or if you have to install ramps, so the number unfortunately to put in a crosswalk like that can vary greatly at a minimum if the ramps are good you're probably 20,000 okay. so if you at took an area least, that had new that, that's just new putting in posts, the signs planet. the push buttons and the solar panel and yeah. making it work yeah. that's at the very 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 low end and probably we don't have scenarios like that on Holcomb yeah well like I said the yep. TSP it states $35,000 for each of those I'm sure that's just a standard price they put for a crosswalk yeah without looking at any details of any particular site yeah. well we point. can definitely share um, <laughs> something for you Bob for the neighborhood that would I mean Holcomb's been on our radar for a long time it's just um, there's there's not a small project on Holcomb 
know there is. But we'll just keep beeping out there on your radar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question. So, did I raise your topic that you were writing your memo on? Is that going to be on the agenda next time? About the uh, housing issue? Yeah, with not having to analyze the traffic impact. That's, that's what my topic was trying to get to, yes. Right, so that's going to be on the agenda next next meeting? Is that that's right? how I understood it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the way I understand that, let's just take the uh, Sears property. You said 120 units could go in? 124, yeah. 124. Now, if the developer is, say, it's all zone. 10,000 square feet right now, lots. He can go in there and put a fourplex on every one of those lots. And technically, we couldn't stop it because it's mandated by the state law. So, I mean, just think okay, instead of 124, you have four times that. I'm not saying that's going to happen, I'm just taking the extreme, all jumping out on Holcomb which with the master plan or the concept plan, I'm sure wasn't figuring on that kind of density. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that, that state law has some implications, yes. not just on traffic, but on water and sewer. And there's and absolutely. no transit there either, that's my concern. Well, transit, yeah. yeah. You yeah. have all that housing density, there's no transit, there's a lot more cars. So that's the discussion I'm trying to get at, is this yeah. point. Yeah, so, uh, I think the state intended it primarily for infill. Correct. And maybe if you had some dilapidated things, they'd pull those down and put a triplex or a duplex in, but developers don't need any more incentive to reduce their risk, uh, their request for more lots and, you know, few more lots and fewer lots so they can yeah, make the so, numbers work for So, them. Ray, I'm not. Are you presenting that or is planning presenting that? I think Laura is presenting that from what I saw in the email. Okay. Yeah, there was the email yeah, I said that, that, that there were, I, don't, I didn't catch, I don't remember the names, but they okay. were willing to come Someone in. from Land Use, okay. Yeah. Well, land Use, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that'll be helpful because, I mean, you're, you're outside of my realm of right. expertise because the code changes that they're having right now, they're dealing a lot with the housing piece. Well, it kind of overlap the internal or city effort to change the zoning and then all of a sudden this thing got yeah so i don't know which trump's it. which yeah but. i will just clarify the i think what land use is planning discussing next month is current changes the ones that happened over last summer with yeah. the city commission the ones that i'm trying to get us to discuss about is what state law is, is yeah. requiring of us which is not included in the uh summer changes that happened last summer from what i've discussed with you know i mean land use about this and they said we've sort of put some changes in here, but they're not compliant with the state law yet because the state law was like a month ago. Yeah. So, and to be compliant with that is like a year from now, I think it is, a year or two from now is when the state law requirement is. But I'm trying to get us to, <coughs> transportation land use, to discuss that issue of making sure we'll have all these extra cars with extra, more dense housing. So, that's what I'm trying to discuss next month. But I, th I mean, I think that's the intent of the, the state is to try to build more housing units and, and to put them in, in areas that already have service. And Correct. Uh, I mean, there's places along Holcomb that you could put fourplex and, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. There's just no transit there, though. That's my concern. I mean, you got all of the, I mean, there is a bus runs there, but... Oh, it's going to have a huge, oh, it's not frequent, though. It's going to have a huge impact, and transportation is going to be one of those impacted, so I think it's an appropriate topic here. And yeah. Mm -hmm. get, yeah. Get a run at it. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but I would definitely agree if if you could take an R10 development and put fourplexes on every lot. Um, I don't know that the market is there for that, and, you know, that that, that, that mm -hmm. would uh, come to pass. But if you did... It wouldn't just be transit that you'd need. Yeah. I've seen subdivisions with four plexes in them. They call them uh, great homes. And so instead of a row house, four row houses, you probably have a mental picture of that. This looks more like uh, a large, very large home. And the units you enter different sides, so it looks like a great home, but it's actually a fourplex. Thing and manage popping those down on lots all over the place. So, and 
maybe duplexes are more realistic in terms of what might happen, but still, you need to talk about it. <coughs> well, I made some notes there just to clarify. I want to make sure that Laura or whoever comes is ready for that. I don't think that that law is intended for when you're creating new subdivisions. But the point is, they created the, they opened the door, so that may not be the intent. They're, they're looking at it as providing incentive for infill Correct. to put a duplex in there or something like that. I don't think they spent much time saying, okay, you have a whole new development, you got 120 uh, 10,000 square foot lots, if the developer wanted to, he could put triplexes in everything or a mix of tri and fourplexes, and that's the state law. You got to allow it. In other words, the state law says you cannot protect single family zone Correct. at 10,000 square feet or even at eight. Any single family zone has to now be open to R1 or, or R2. Pardon me? Is it R1 or R2? Uh, I'm, I'm just sure. saying, if it's single family, that was the intent, which is 10 and 8 for us, right? Six. So, yeah, so it's, it's, the door is open and you can't close it. Yeah, the intent of the law that they passed may not necessarily match what the developers will take advantage Correct. of. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? This meeting is adjourned.